Uh, welcome to Marion University. Uh, my name is Pierre Atlas. Uh, I serve as, as a director of the uh, Richard G. Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies here at Marion University. I'm also a political science professor. Um, it is uh, an honor to uh, uh, welcome you here and to introduce our speaker. Uh, Senator Luger, uh, as, as uh, you all know, uh, served uh, as Indiana's uh, U.S. Senator for 36 years, the longest serving uh, Senator in the, from the state of Indiana. Um, he began his uh, public service career on the Indianapolis uh, School Board and then was mayor of Indianapolis. And there's a couple quick stories I just want to say um, real quick. I hope you don't mind. Um, during, uh, uh, there, there's, a, uh, there's a play uh, that's, that's been performed in Indianapolis um, about, that takes place during the um, assassination of uh, Martin Luther King when Robert F. Kennedy was here in Indianapolis and gave a very famous speech um, that a lot, some of you may have, have, have been here uh, to hear it. Um, and uh, Indianapolis was the only city in the United States, only a significant urban city that did not erupt into violence on the day that uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Robert Kennedy played a major role in that, but another person who made a major role in it was uh, Mayor Luger, who went on television that night, um, gave a speech, I've read the transcript of the speech, gave a speech in 1968, which the day that King was assassinated happened to be um, Senator Luger's birthday. And, um, and he basically gave a speech. He called, he had the police uh, play a very calming role. He got everybody to sort of, um, take, take a breath. And, 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 uh, again, he, along with Robert Kennedy, uh, Mayor Luger played a major role in, in why it was that of all of the cities in the United States, Indianapolis was the only one that did not erupt into violence when, when Dr. King was assassinated. Um, jump forward, uh, uh, before entering public service, uh, Senator Luger graduated from Denison University, uh, with a, a, a bachelor's degree in political science. Um, I'm glad to say. People always say, what can I do with a degree in political science? Well, this is what you can do. Um, and then uh, he was a Rhodes Scholar, and then he joined the U.S. Navy, where he served as an intelligence officer, briefing the chief of naval operations, and also uh, making uh, briefings to uh, the CIA and, and, and sometimes the White House as well. Uh, then uh, the public service, and, and ultimately with 36 years in the United States Senate, as uh, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, the Agriculture Committee, um, senior scholar, uh, se senior uh, um, uh, uh, statesman, um, one of the true great statesmen um, that we've had in the United States Senate and in the United States. Um, Dick Luger has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize along with Sam Nunn for the uh, Nunn-Luger uh, Nuclear Threat Reduction Program to get uh, former Soviet Union states to get rid of their nuclear weapons. Um, he was also a presidential candidate in 1996 uh, on, the, on the Republican side. And so it has a, a lot of insight to share on everything, including what it's like to be a presidential candidate and perhaps some comments on, on what's going on right now. Um, with, with all of that, uh, let me uh, please, uh, with, with great um, uh, pleasure, introduce to you uh, our annual Global Studies Lecture with uh, Senator Richard Luger. Thank you so much, Pierre. I really appreciate, as always, your generous introductions and your wonderful friendship and the great leadership you give to students on this great campus. And it's a real privilege, once again, to salute President Elsner. Uh, I'm amazed at the growth of Marion University, uh, this beautiful building in which we now have our meeting this evening, uh, is an extraordinary example of his leadership and those who have worked with him and will make a huge difference in the service of, to our city. I'm, I'm excited always by Marion University students. Some we have met and over the course of the years they come into public life and fulfill really the expectations and the dreams that these professors and Dr. Elsner have for them and that I have. And tonight we had a remarkable meeting with, I would say, at least 25 students and maybe more who are, are terrific. But I'm going to dwell tonight essentially on the most grave challenges that face the United States in our foreign policy. Uh, there are a great number you could select from, but uh, I believe that many of you will agree by the time we've concluded my remarks that uh, we're on track, at least in finding those that are most dire and significant and timely. And in your questions, perhaps uh, you can illuminate further portions of the world if that is your privilege. But let me just start with Russia. I start with Russia because I spent a lot of time in Russia. I've, I've spent a lot of time with Russian leaders. 
it all began really uh, when President Ronald Reagan asked a group of Senate leaders to go to Geneva, Switzerland in 1986. This was the first time that President Reagan felt it might be possible to negotiate with the former Soviet Union the reduction of nuclear weapons that were aimed at both of our countries. We were in a period of what was often called mutually assured destruction. By that we meant, and it was a 40-year period of time in our history, whether many were aware of it or not, in which, um, right, which uh, essentially the Russians and uh, we had well over 10,000 nuclear warheads, and these were very powerful warheads, many of them on missiles, six, eight, or ten per missile, aimed at every military installation in our mutual countries and every large city, as it turned out, in terms of the Russian aim. I found out about this one time as I went into a silo in Siberia where a large missile had been taken out. I went down to the 13th floor where the guards who had been on station there uh, were around a table. I noticed on the walls around the table were pictures of American cities. And uh, to say the least, this uh, was shocking. I, I remember back eight years that I served as mayor of Indianapolis, I had no idea that uh, nuclear warheads were aimed at this city. I, I was informed that maybe two or three of them could have wiped us all out in that period of time, whether we knew about it or not. Um, and I found Indianapolis was a target. This is sobering to say the least, but in any event, to make a long story short, 1986 was not the year in which negotiations were possible. I met uh, with Sam Nunn, who was then chairman of the Armed Services Committee of the Senate, a senator from Georgia on the Democratic side. I had not known Sam well in the Senate, but I got to know him well in Geneva. And we often, in the subsequent five years, went to Russia and followed up with Russians we had met at Geneva. What was happening? We found out from them that the situation was deteriorating rapidly in Russia. In fact, by 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And it was at this time a dramatic moment occurred in my life and in his Russians with whom we've been meeting came to Washington. We met around a round table in Sam Nunn's office. Now, this table is still significant in my life. After Sam left the Senate, I had to roll down the hallway to my office. <laughs> and after I left the Senate, we couldn't roll it over to the Luger Center, but nevertheless, we picked it up and it's there. Um, because around that table, the Russians met with us and they said to us, to Sam and to me, you've got a lot of problems. And they said, what are the problems? They said, well, many of the installations in which the warheads with the missiles that are aimed at you uh, are, are located, we're finding desertion by our armed forces. They're not getting paid. And furthermore, some are stealing materials to sell to other countries to support their families or to make money, as the case may be. Um, there could be mistakes. There could inadvertently be a, a shot fired that really was not anticipated by any government or the military. So I said, well, what do you want from us? They said, first of all, we're going to need a lot of your money. <laughs> and uh, beyond that, we're going to need a lot of your technicians to help take down the warheads, take off the missiles, begin the destruction of these weapons. By the time we're finished, we may need some of your military, we don't know. Uh, it was a very sobering moment, but it was the beginning of the so-called non luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Act, because from that moment onward, we began to put together in a bipartisan way, members of the Senate at breakfast meetings. One of them addressed by Ash Carter, the new Secretary of Defense of our country, who was then at the Bell for School at Harvard and who outlined how an appropriation of X number of dollars uh, could be a, an immediate situation of aid in, in this dilemma. And to make a long story short, in the last five days of the 1991 congressional session, 
the non luger Act passed, but it was not necessarily a happy moment for President Bush and the administration. They, they felt that uh, Senators Nunn and Luger had really overstepped their bounds. This was a major foreign policy dilemma, and it did not come from the administration. It did not come from the Secretary of State or Defense, and so we were having an argument with our own government. We, we took some people, starting with General Burns, the chief military aide to the president, back with us over to Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. We all literally got religion together. We saw the dilemma. And uh, we began then to think through how money could be spent effectively. Uh, but um, it was a long stretch during 19, uh, rather, uh, during that particular 1992, because it was an election year. President Bush was running for re-election against Bill Clinton. He lost that election. And Sam and I went back over to Russia at that point to reassure the Russian leadership that we were still there, that we were moving on board. Um, the Russian leadership said to us, and, and this, you'll have to beg the translation, but uh, they said, we know you're going to see President Kravchuk in Ukraine after you see us. Uh, tell Kravchuk we're going to bomb the blank out of him uh, if he doesn't give up his nuclear weapons. Uh, well, we went down to see President Kravchuk. We had a dinner with him, and uh, during the conversation around the table, I said, Mr. President, the United States is prepared to spend $150 million to help you get rid of your nuclear weapons, which we know you want to do, because there is no longer logistical support with uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union and with Russia and so forth. They're a menace to you. He said, indeed, there are. He grabbed me almost by the nape of the neck. Sam, likewise, took us outside for a meeting with the press. Uh, Ukraine was, had a very small press corps in those days. Uh, the two people we met with, one was a radio announcer and one was uh, from a newspaper. And the president said to these journalists, Senator Luger has just made a very significant offer to our country. He has offered Ukraine $175 million <laughs> for our nuclear weapons. On the way back to the table, Sam says, Dick, where did you get such a crazy idea? I said, easy, Sam. It's going to work out. And uh, I went to see President Bush when we got back. He was a good sport about all this. I understood the predicament. Wrote a letter to Kravchuk men mentioning 175. Um, now, as a matter of fact, it took several years to get rid of all of the weapons in Ukraine. They were the third largest nuclear power. Uh, as a matter of fact, many trips back and forth of all sorts. And it probably uh, mounted up to more like 700, 800 million, maybe more by the time we finished. But uh, nevertheless, it was a very important part of the safety for our country that was involved in that situation. And it likewise uh, led to more confidence on the part of the Russians as we were dealing with them, that uh, they were not going to have a problem with, uh, with Ukraine, hostile as it might be at that point. I mention all of this because um, the non luger Act essentially came to an end early in 2013. The Russians decided they did not want any more inspections by Americans, any more trips by Sam and Dick or anybody else. Uh, essentially, we had signed the New START Treaty, which said that both countries would be limited to no more than 1,550 warheads. And uh, that's where it's been left at this point. Um, this is still a lot uh, of warheads, to say the least. I read an article not long ago, which was very sobering, which said essentially, in both of our countries, we're not on hair trigger alert, but we're on an alert system in which, uh, for example, if the Russians were to fire a nuclear weapon at a city here or a military installation, uh, the uh, President of the United States would have maybe seven or eight minutes to make a decision as to, to fire back or what to do about it. Uh, if the President uh, was Asleep in the White House, the president would have to be wakened up and, and briefed in that period of time in order to make that kind of decision. 
It's a very sobering deal still in, in terms of the potential tensions with, with Russia at this stage. I, I start with that because uh, Russia has suffered grievously in terms of its economic future. By and large, the price of oil has gone down and has hit not just the uh, OPEC countries, but the Russians who depend upon that for their resources and their reserves and so forth. Likewise, um, the Russians, uh, after their invasion of Crimea, which they took over from Ukraine, and furthermore, the stirring up of trouble in the eastern part of Ukraine, have suffered from sanctions from the NATO countries, the European countries, and ourselves. Um, these are um, interesting times for President Putin because he has an electorate that in many cases would be very, very unhappy with the leadership. This is true in most countries where there is grievous recession and not much hope of economic recovery. But um, President Putin, uh, either astutely or however you want to describe it, by venturing into Crimea and Ukraine, by taking over a part of Georgia, by um, giving hints that even the Baltic states that have large Russian populations uh, might uh, see some Russian influence uh, in those areas. He has revived with many Russians a sense that the old Russia may be back. That, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the Russia of the old days in which uh, there was universal respect uh, might uh, be a part of the Putin heritage. And so as a result, um, these adventures have been helpful to him. I cite that because Russia has become involved, as we all know, in Syria. And uh, in Syria, Russia has an ally with President Assad, who still controls a small portion of the eastern part of the country up against the seacoast. The Russians have a base there, which they want to preserve. Furthermore, Assad is supported by the Iranians, and the Russians are firmly tied together with Iran. Uh, Russia has had airstrikes, but our general perception is that most of the strikes have been on parts of Syria that are not a part of the Assad area. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we're not sure that they're hitting even ISIL, which is supposed to be the target. They may be hitting other Syrians who have been a problem for Assad. Now, I mentioned this as I venture from Russia to Iraq and to Syria, uh, because um, it's not really clear uh, what role Russia wants to play in these particular situations. With regard to Iraq, the United States, of course, played a very large role at great sacrifice of our military lives as well as uh, fortune of Americans. It started with the uh, fear that they had nuclear weapons. This did not turn out to be the case. But nevertheless, a uh, decision was made that Saddam Hussein had to go. This was a brutal dictatorship that, that uh, could not last and with peace in that area. We went to war. We uh, took out Saddam Hussein, but it took a long while uh, to move through all of of, of Iraq because there were, in fact, three large contending forces. Uh, the Sunni part had supported Saddam Hussein. The Kurds in the north certainly did not, nor did uh, the Shiites. Uh, so there are three parts of Iraq, three very large groups. They were suppressed by Saddam, but after he was gone, there really was no suppression. There was no government to speak of. It took quite a while for the United States to work its way through Iraq to a point where we could help the Iraqis form a constitution that could lead to elections, uh, to a president uh, and leadership that came really from the will of the people. We, we, we came to that point finally. Now the sad point is that uh, after the election of uh, Mr. Maliki, uh, it turned out uh, that the uh, Shiites who now were in the government, had very little tolerance for the Sunnis or the Kurds. Furthermore, he was not an effective leader with regard to the military in one way or another. 
Um, we strongly suggested that they needed to do better, and the Iraqis eventually did replace him with another president who has not been particularly effective. Uh, by and large, the Iraqis have seen ISIL, the Islamic State, occupy now a number of large cities in Iraq, uh, and uh, they have not been able to do much about it with the exception of the Kurds in the northern part of the country, the so-called Peshmerga, who have, in fact, responded to training from the United States. They have responded with weapons that we have furnished and airstrikes that we have supported. So uh, the Kurds have taken over portions of Iraq that have been taken over by ISIL and have had some military successes. Uh, this has encouraged some Kurds, and I don't want to overstate this, to say the time has come really for a Kurdish state, for independence of Kurds not only in Iraq, but Kurds in Turkey, Kurds in Syria. Now, the Kurds in Turkey are often characterized by the Turks as terrorists, the PKK, they are called. So the Turks are still battling the Kurds, even while the Kurds are working with us to battle ISIL and offer some new government there in, in the northern part of Iraq. The Syrian Kurds perhaps might form a barrier state at the northern part of the border with Turkey, but the Turks are uneasy about that. Still might happen in any event. But I, I mention this because uh, for the time being, uh, frequently uh, the advice is that we're going to have to send troops into Iraq to help the Iraqis, not simply to train their own forces, but really to fight the fight for them, which they are not fighting or not able to fight. Now, Iraq is one side of the problem. Uh, it's the, sort of the eastern side. The Syrian side on, on the west is, is a side in which um, President Assad had been in a civil war with the rest of the country for some time. He has been a cruel dictator without any doubt. He used chemical weapons against his own people to suppress them. He has not been particularly successful. The civil war went on and on and on. And the uh, territory that he controls uh, has diminished substantially. But in the areas that were not controlled by Assad, ISIL has taken strips and actually believes that it has some borders, but it's offering some government. Likewise, has come across the line over into Iraq. And as you see maps sort of charting where ISIL is, why you find little black strips in both countries, sort of coordinated together. Um, ISIL has some funding from oil wells that have been taken over in both countries. It has a lot of funding from extortion of people in areas that it's taken over, or taxes, as they would say. Uh, it has been able to provide uh, arms uh, to those who are extending the ISIL boundaries, but it by no means controls all of Syria or even a half of it, to be truthful. As you look at the maps, uh, some areas are neither ISIL or Assad. And, and in the case of, uh, of Syria, the United States has suggested we might offer training to Saudi forces, perhaps or other uh, Middle Eastern countries that would help the rest of the Syrians take over their country. But uh, this has not led to very many volunteers or very much successful military action. I mention all of this because uh, the complexity of it, I think, is apparent uh, to each one of us. Let's say that we follow the advice of some Americans who said, well, really, Enough is enough. You need to get the armed forces of the United States, just as we uh, assembled them for Iraq or Afghanistan, tens of thousands that might be required, plus the aircraft and the armament, and go in and clean house. Somebody defeat ISIL in both of these countries and, and make clear that uh, they are defeated and that's that. Um, but the problem then, of course, is then what happens? Who, in fact, governs Syria? Do we, our armed forces that 
swept out ISIL. And um, this has led at least to some suggestions that the initial stage should be perhaps uh, some type of peace agreement, some ceasefire in Syria on that side of the question, in which um, Assad and other Syrians have been fighting Assad. Even ISIL would agree that for the time being we're going to, to lay down arms or at least stop firing at each other. And, of course, the United States suggests that uh, uh, sine qua non of all this is that Assad must go. The Russians say, no, he must stay. And uh, the Iranians, likewise, back Assad staying. Uh, so as a result, uh, we've not made much headway with the thought of a ceasefire or some thought of a constitution-building process. And it's not clear even if we had very good luck. Let's say Assad leaves and everybody lays down their arms. Who, in fact, would, would govern Syria? Where are the leaders? Where are the political parties, the contending parties, and what have you? This is going to be, I think, a very long-time situation. In Iraq, the possibilities are still that the Iraqi government might get a second win, that they might be able, with our assistance, to get rid of ISIL from their major cities, push ISIL out of the country. Uh, it may be that the Kurds, even though they entertain the idea of an independent country, decide this is not the time and place for that. But it will require a Shiite government to have some tolerance for the Sunnis in the country. The Sunnis, in many cases, are very supportive of ISIL. Not all, but some, uh, because uh, that really represents their best bet as they see it. Oh, I, I've gone into this in some detail because uh, this question is going to be with us. Whoever is elected president or whoever is involved in the Congress, we're all going to have to become much more thoughtful and sophisticated about all of this uh, because it won't go away. And the problems will be not simply in Syria and Iraq, but as we now see, ISIL has come down to the shoreline of, of Libya. Now, Libya, after our government and others said Gaddafi must go, he's a brutal dictator and so forth, Gaddafi was killed. And he left. And there's no government in Libya. Hasn't been since that time. So ISIL is able to pick up uh, there uh, on the coastline a city might extend itself further. That might be true of ISIL in other African countries, as a matter of fact. Um, and the problem then for us, as we think about terrorism in the United States, is that uh, there are a number of European citizens who, for various reasons, have found another religion have gone over to fight with ISIL in Syria or, or in Iraq. A very few Americans apparently have taken the same course. <laughs> the question then becomes in both areas, both Europe and the United States, are our intelligence resources sufficient to be able to chart who these persons might be? Uh, who has gone where? And who is wanting to return? And uh, those wanting to return uh, might, in fact, be persons who could commit acts of terror out of their new religious convictions uh, and have almost a suicidal impulse in doing so. So in this way, uh, ISIL is not simply a remote situation. The stronger it becomes, the more dangerous to our European allies and likewise to ourselves on some occasions. Now, uh, in addition to all that I've described, uh, we have another situation in American foreign policy in which sometime around 2011, we had what was called a pivot to Asia in our foreign policy. I was a member and chairman for a while of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and it was never really explained to us precisely what the pivot to Asia was all about. We tried to gain some knowledge of this. I went to Pearl Harbor in 2012, as a matter of fact, visit with our admirals out there. And that was a good educational experience in which they indicated that the pivot to Asia was going to mean, for instance, more activity on Guam, 
which is much closer to Asia than Hawaii, for example, and warships that we would have uh, floating around the South China Sea, the Indian Ocean, the area of the Philippines. In other words, we would begin to show the flag. We would show a presence. We became active in the ASEAN um, group and an APEC, two organizations of several Asian states in which we had not been particularly active. And uh, we began to send our Secretary of State or occasionally the Vice President or others to uh, annual meetings or meetings more often than that. During that same trip, uh, when I was in Hawaii, I visited the Philippines. USS George Washington, a great aircraft carrier, was in the Manila Harbor then. I went out, went on board that great carrier, learned much more about how planes are shot off the deck and how <laughs> with the wires uh, as they come in, they're caught and so forth. Saw a good number of Hoosiers there underneath. And um, I also found uh, in Manila a tremendous warm reception for the American sailors who were coming aboard uh, and ashore. I found a Clark Air Force Base, and really now it's just Clark uh, Air Base, but it was a major base for the United States for a long time, as was Subic. In due course, about 20 years ago, the Filipinos decided they did not want us around anymore in those places. But that attitude was changing very rapidly. Uh, the thought, as a matter of fact, was that the Chinese had designs on islands that were very close to the Philippines. Um, not as close as the Senkaku Islands between China and Japan, uh, that is historically have been a source of conflict. And uh, with regard to many countries on the coastline, uh, there were feelings that the Chinese regularly came within the 10-mile limit of what they felt were the territorial waters of their country. So as a, as a result, uh, they were very pleased to see American ships coming through there. We took the position that uh, we have, have played a role as a country in keeping the sea lanes all over the world open for foreign trade. It's been very important for our country, but very important for the rest of the world. The rest of the world has depended upon this. And the rest of the world, uh, aside maybe from the Chinese, welcomed uh, this new activity on our part. Now, it's not clear what the Chinese designs may be ultimately. One thing that has attracted attention is that on many of the atolls there uh, in those oceans, the Chinese have put in much more sand. They've built up the atolls until finally there really is a, a surface sufficient in some cases, to even build airfields and various other installations. Um, that's certainly a new factor. It's not really clear what the relationship of the Chinese military is to their civilian leadership. I remember asking that question when a Chinese leader came to Washington maybe half a dozen years ago. We had a private meeting with the, the Chinese leader after his uh, state dinner at the White House. And I asked uh, Mr. President, I said, what uh, is your role? I said, our, our president is commander in chief of our armed forces. Are you commander in chief of the armed forces of China? So he smiled wanly and said, well, not exactly. He said, the Communist Party is the control for all of us. We work within the party uh, to uh, see who is who and so forth. Well, that's is still true. The, the current leadership, uh, the so-called civilian leadership, seems to have more control, seems to be more articulate about Chinese foreign policy aims. Despite the Senkaku Island problem with Japan, uh, uh, there has not been conflict over it, thank goodness. We have put more Marines in Australia, interestingly enough. We still have quite a number of armed forces in South Korea. When I visited there, I saw uh, General Truman, who gave me a, tr a tremendous briefing for several hours on where all the North Koreans were, what role they were playing in the situation. Uh, and that, of course, is the source of great difficulty for the South Koreans. Although at the same time, those of you who have visited Seoul, the capital of South Korea, will have noted extraordinary buildings 
the hundreds of thousands of people in apartments all over the place, the vitality of, of that city, which is a very few miles from the so-called DMZ, the boundary with North Korea. Uh, so um, interesting questions over there. Uh, but nonetheless, our relationship with China is based a lot on trade, and it's based also on a certain amount of confidence the Chinese have in our economic system. I cite as one example the fact that most of the Chinese monetary reserves have been placed in U.S. Treasury bonds. They bought our Treasury bonds, the bonds, some of them paying almost zero interest at this point. Chinese not interested in the return on the bonds, interested on the safety of their money. Trillions of dollars of our bonds. Very interesting association in that respect. Likewise, uh, we have uh, attempted to bring about an increase in trade, which has been helpful for jobs in America. Um, the Chinese economy is uh, going through some evolution that not all of us understand, but uh, the growth rate is probably declining, still maybe 6% plus, which is a pretty good rate, but not in the double digits that it had been. And uh, we're not really sure some time to time about the banking system and the stock market. We have, those of you who follow those markets, days in which strange things seem to happen based upon rumors from China. But uh, nevertheless, still dealing pretty closely. And uh, that's encouraging. And we are still keeping our fleet going, keeping the sea lanes open everywhere. Even in the midst of the Middle Eastern crisis, quite apart from the South China Sea dilemma. Now, there are many other areas of the world we might cover tonight, but I, I've selected this pattern because I, I believe these are challenges that uh, most of us can understand. Most of us really need to go to school all the time to understand better, to be able to offer advice uh, to our legislators, to our executive officials, uh, to press people that might ask us about it. We, we really need to do our homework. It, it will not do simply in a categorical statement uh, to say we're going to bomb the what out of everybody or we're going to go back and forth. Uh, that's not going to solve anything. Uh, we are on the process, I believe, of making some headway uh, in, uh, in Iraq. We are making some headway in Afghanistan. We're making some headway, I think, with the Chinese. I hope that our relations with Russia might improve. I think that would be important for them, too, to see that improvement. But all of these are challenges that are out there that are important. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, given, I believe, a concerted effort on our part are potentially soluble within a period of time. I, I thank each one of you for the patience uh, you've exerted tonight to go through all the minutia and the details of this. But uh, these are things very much on my mind and heart, and perhaps on yours. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Senator Luger. Um, so we have some time for some questions. Uh, for those of you who have not been here before, uh, there in front of you on the table are little microphones. And so if you would, uh, when, when you raise your hand, we'll call on you. And then there's a button that says push. So push that when you're asking the question, and that way everybody can hear you, and we're recording everything so for, our, for our filming. And then everybody will hear your question. And then when you're done asking your question, please release the button, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, go ahead and, and do some questions. And then also there'll be a reception afterwards. Um, and I'd just like to say, first of all, that you just taught two of my classes, um, uh, both my global studies class and my American foreign policy. We've been talking about everything that you just said. So thank you. It's, it's, it's been terrific. Only with, you had much more sophistication than I do. Um, yes, sir. Question. Are you encouraged by the fact that you push the button down? Are you encouraged by the fact that the isolation is used and sent into a land for all of that and attracted much of the problems? Yes, I'm encouraged by that fact. I don't believe that uh, Americans are taking an isolationist point of view. On the other hand, polls are shown in the press from time to time in which it's apparent that 
Americans do not want to send troops here, there, or yon, or what have you. Uh, it, it sort of gets back to the first campaign that President Obama had in which uh, he campaigned to get our troops out of Iraq. This was a very strong feature of the Democratic Party doctrine at that point. I remember conferences that year with uh, Democrats and Republicans around the table. Democrats would point to us and said, Iraq is your war, your Republican war. Uh, we want to solve Afghanistan. We want out of Iraq. Well, Obama won. He had a meeting at the White House and many of the same congressional leaders. And he said, I want to make an announcement to each one of you, first of all. We're coming out of Iraq by the end of the first year of my presidency. Well, several of the Democrats were furious. And they said, you promised right away out of here after we win the election. Um, uh, but it took them at least a year to get out, even though the Iraqis wanted us out of the place. And there, there has been that thought really ever since that on the part of many Americans, it was a mistake to send people over there at all to begin with. Now, if you think that, then perhaps you get back to the thought, should we have been worrying about getting rid of Saddam Hussein? Should we have been in the so-called Arab Spring, uh, eager to say Gaddafi must go? And he went, and you have chaos in Libya. Mubarak must go. Well, he went, and the Muslim Brotherhood took over, and they've been replaced by General Sisi, who is a dictator, maybe a milder one than, than some, but... Uh, you know, literally, Assad must go. Well, Assad is still there, and I, we describe sort of his situation. I, in other words, we've had a tendency, because we do believe in democracy, in human rights, in rights for women, and so forth, to say these things are intolerable. We, we have a conscience uh, streak to, to get rid of these uh, terrible rulers, and so forth. The dilemma is that uh, the replacements are not always clear. And as a matter of fact, if you, unless you have really the basis uh, in terms of, of the, the thoughts of the country, the ability of people to think about the problems of democracy and self-government, uh, you're going to be back into strong leadership, if not dictatorship in these situations. Yes, sir. I'm sort of a dunderhead about political science and international affairs. But just from having read novels and history about the Middle East, you know, within a few weeks of the time we began hearing about ISIL and ISIS as whatever they were called then, I was thinking they were a great, a great threat. So I've been wondering, given the early history of militant religious military movements which devastated regions in the Middle East, why was there an apparent lack of even expressed concern if not stronger methods, military and or diplomatic, to deal with it when they were still a relatively small and weaker force than they are now? Why didn't we jump right in at the beginning and nip it in the bud? I believe the uh, candid answer is that uh, the politics of doing so in our country were not very favorable. By that I mean not just the administration, but many members of Congress said we do not want to take on the responsibility of sending American forces in to fight ISIL. And, uh, and furthermore, they felt that the majority of their constituents felt that way, as they took polling uh, in their areas, that they were representing their constituents accurately. It may likewise be both the members and the president and the constituents did not understand ISIL, did not understand the implications of what was going to happen. Maybe that's easier for all of us now. But I think the candid answer is that uh, this was the sensitivity of people in public life at that point. Yes, sir. Senator, it's, you've painted, painted an interesting picture and your knowledge and your experience along with Lee Hamilton who is in the news recently for the, the, medal of, the Presidential Medal of Freedom and all his work. You have great experience and background. Would you comment, to the degree that you choose to, on the other members of the Senate and the House of Representatives and their knowledge and 
experience and also the presidential candidates who are now <laughs> there. And do they have any, you know, number one, what kind of credentials might they have to lead this country as we look at the future of the world and our role in it? By the way, that was the first question that the students asked. Senator. <laughs> It only requires about a seven-chapter answer. <laughs> With regard to the presidential candidates, uh, the debate and discussion thus far has been very disappointing. It's not, uh, I don't want to be unfair that some have not done their homework or do not have a background in foreign policy. But uh, just to take the first instance I mentioned tonight of a commander-in-chief who within eight minutes has to make a fateful decision. Uh, I'm not confident about these candidates uh, having the gravitas and the background to do that. Um, now, there are several members of Congress who, because of their experience over many years, uh, have at least studied the issues, have traveled widely, have met leaders, some of them hostile to our country, quite apart from those that are friendly. Um, I, I cite people like John McCain, for example, who uh, you may or may not agree with. Him. John is always somewhat more aggressive than whoever else is in the debate in terms of the use of armed forces. But he takes this seriously. He travels widely. Lindsey Graham has been sort of a partner with John McCain, perhaps not with the same gravitas, but at the same time, someone who takes all of this very seriously. Uh, and I think there are members of the Foreign Relations Committee and the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, likewise, who have uh, really a considerable background in all of this. But uh, they are not going to be president of the United States. They could be very important parts of support for a president who had a program. They could offer advice to a president if he would ask for it. They actually uh, had round tables, and their, uh, their points of view might get into it. But um, I, I appreciate your mention of my colleague, Lee Hamilton. One of the nice things about Lee Hamilton was at some point he was chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. At the same time, I was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We met in conference committees. We worked out bills. Uh, together with our colleagues on both sides of the aisle. We made a lot of progress. It was very small in comparison to the very tough cases I've offered tonight. But uh, people like this are indispensable in our situation. Same with Sam Nunn, a remarkable partner throughout all the years, uh, despite uh, whatever may be his political affiliation. And so I'm confident there will be people arising in our public life, such as these, Hopefully they will have, really, an audience, and they will be sufficiently influential at the right time. Yes? Okay. Um, thank you for taking my question. I'm, I'm a registered Democrat, and I want to say that it was a very sad day in the history of Indiana when you lost the Republican primary a few years ago, and a very sad day for our nation as well. <laughs> I heard you several times tonight talk about um, easy answers that some of our politicians are giving us, and oftentimes you have um, rebutted those answers with the, well, what next question. What can we as an electorate do, what, what other questions can we as an electorate ask our politicians um, to get deeper into the real issue and, and through the rhetoric? I think the first uh, point is that each one of us uh, has the responsibility to raise questions, to ask our people in government uh, about various issues, to show an interest in this. If there, if there is a feeling on the part of those in the administration or the Congress that the public really is simply in a not caring attitude or simply a very negative, angry attitude, as opposed to specifically wanting to talk about ISIL 
or to talk about Russia or China or so forth, um, then we're not going to make much headway. In other words, you can indicate that you're very angry, you're very unhappy, uh, very disturbed. But specifically, uh, if you want to write a good letter to a member of Congress or to the president, you need to do your homework to think through at least as best you can. Uh, but to, by writing to show an interest that you care about this, that you think this is a very important thing to do in American public life, quite apart from foreign policy only. Uh, there has been a general suspicion on the part of the Congress and the President that the American public has not been that interested in foreign policy. That, uh, as a matter of fact, we are interested primarily in jobs, which we are, uh, in the turnabout in terms of recession in our country. Uh, of we're, we're interested, uh, obviously, in our children and in public education or in in colleges and student debt and all the problems that are accompanying with that. It is only occasionally that we, we give some thought to foreign policy and usually then in a very negative way that our leaders are not very good at it or, or that uh, somehow or other here we go again. Uh, I, I, I would just say, you know, uh, take time to analyze even one or two problems that uh, your own insight, your own homework might make a contribution. It could be much more effective maybe than you would think with a member of Congress who gets a letter of this variety, of which I suspect there are very few. Yes. Senator Luger, uh, uh, right now uh, many delegates, many countries are meeting in Paris uh, to talk about the COP21. Uh, working on climate change. Uh, there's a lot of hope that something might come out of it, but there's also concerns that and challenges to get us get the countries all on the same page. Uh, conceivably, our president could sign on uh, at, at the end or uh, as this concludes, uh, but he's only got another year or so uh, in his administration, and the, the Congress seems to be uh, mostly negative to what he's talking about. Uh, how long does whatever he signed last when he leaves, leaves office? I have no way of knowing precisely, but I would say that uh, the issue involved here of climate change is going to continue on regardless of who is the next president. Now, temporarily, uh, a president could be elected who, who says, well, I just am not going to follow through on President Obama's situation. Uh, and so for a while we have sort of a stymie there. But uh, very rapidly, I, I believe that, that there will be pressures for whoever is the president and whoever is in the Congress to move ahead with other countries. Uh, I believe that the uh, climate change dangers are real and and some would feel that the goal that's been set in Paris of limiting this to two uh, degrees Celsius 3.6 Fahrenheit is still going to lead to a large number of islands in the Pacific being covered to most of the ice in the Arctic melting that these things are going to happen uh, regardless even if we make the large changes that are implied by the Paris Agreement now, once again, we get into parochial politics. For example, in Indiana, we still have a certain number of people in coal mines. West Virginia has many more, Kentucky likewise. Um, the coal industry is very opposed to anything happening with regard to this climate change business because almost all of the uh, strictures call for the limitation of the use of coal and the replacement of coal, and the shutting down of utilities that use coal. Now, even if you're not in a coal mining situation and you're in the utilities, you would say, well, this means that uh, we're going to have to charge more for electricity if it comes uh, from other means. And so consumers say, well, we don't want to pay any more for electricity. We've got enough problems as it is without seeing 
that go up. So you have a consumer revolt quite apart from the utilities. Uh, presently, uh, the, President Obama has, as perhaps you know, uh, presidential orders for uh, utilities, and that's going to cause a certain amount of closing of coal mines and so forth. And uh, Republicans are rebelling and saying you're using presidential orders, not legislation. We've not voted for any of this. As a matter of fact, we object to it. So to pick up your point, you could come to the end of the Obama administration, the end of this Congress, and these folks would say we're going to reverse all of this because uh, it was simply one man's dictatorial stricture. But at the same time, uh, we're going to have to have many of these changes, maybe many more beyond what the president is proposing, in my judgment. And that probably is going to mean a change of jobs in many states, including our own, a, a, a change in the cost, perhaps, of energy, uh, the need for much greater conservation of energy. I mean, that's one way of holding down your expense privately to turn off the lights and so forth. Um, these are all unpleasant outcomes, and therefore, politically, uh, they are difficult. And in a campaign year, people pick up rapidly on the objections and play to those, as opposed to a more courageous stand about the future. Yes. Thank you for coming, Senator, very much. Um, I, first, I just want to say that I spent the last few days writing a big essay for Dr. Atlas where I identified the top three um, threats to American uh, foreign interests in the next presidency, and they were ISIS, Russia, and China. Well, we're on the same track. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, my question is, I've been studying the uh, nuclear disarmament of the Ukraine quite a lot, and it's the opinion of some experts that if they had maintained a part of their nuclear arsenal, that the current seizure of Crimea and the uh, war in the eastern part of the country would never have occurred. Um, looking back on what happened, do you feel this is the case? That's a good question. No, I don't. I would say that uh, if Crimea still, or rather Ukraine still had nuclear weapons, the um, thought that they would use them against Russia is, is I think, um, far-fetched, to be truthful. I, I believe, however, that what was occurring in Ukraine at that time that Sam Nunn and I were involved in all of this was that uh, the government of Ukraine really wanted to get rid of the weapons because it felt it could not control the safety of them. They had huge amounts of material, um, huge problems in terms of simply maintaining their armed forces. If the Russians were having problems of desertion because of near bankruptcy, that clearly was the problem in Ukraine also. Uh, and, and so as a result, our coming into Ukraine really uh, averted potential chaos as well as danger for the people of Ukraine. Uh, I, I believe that um, uh, ultimately the problem is in Ukraine boil down not to the lack of nuclear weapons, but to wholesale corruption of the governmental officials and, and most of the local governments of Ukraine. Ukraine was weakened by the lack of integrity of its public officials. And when Yushchenko uh, was banished, it was because he really was one of the worst. But he was not the only one. The current government of Ukraine is still struggling with this even while it has these problems in Donetsk and elsewhere in the east, quite apart from the loss of Crimea. Now, the Russians have problems, as you know, but this is simply topical in Crimea because all the power has been shut down for the last two or three weeks. And in part, this is because there are people in Ukraine who still have some control over the services to Crimea and can cause trouble over there, too. Um, so we're, we're at a predicament in which the United States is striving to help Ukraine, finding it very difficult still to get money and resources to the right people who can make decisions with integrity. Thank you, Senator. Yes, sir. 
Um, obviously, our political relationship with Russia is very different than our relationship with China. But do you believe it would ever be possible for us to establish a trade relationship with Russia even comparable to that with China? I don't see any possibility of a trade relationship comparable to that with China uh, in the near future. And by near future, I may mean maybe some decades down the trail. Uh, the Russians have retained at least uh, some economy because of these oil and natural gas resources. But um, when the, the predecessor uh, to uh, President Putin came over to the United States uh, in that interim period that Putin was no longer president, we had a, a conference. He went out to Silicon Valley to try to get some idea of somebody that might want to invest in Russia with sophisticated uh, tools that are a part of that. Um, no one really wanted to do so. Uh, when he came to Washington, the fact was that he indicated there was not very much going on in Russia in terms of more sophisticated production, uh, new, uh, new tools, new products, what have you. Uh, in, in essence, uh, it's an economy that um, really doesn't have much going for it. Now, we have no reason to want to import oil or natural gas from Russia. They, they would have those resources. We have no reason to want to import uh, grain. Um, sometimes the Russians produce enough for themselves. Sometimes they don't. Ukraine still has fairly large grain exports. Uh, but we really have no need for that. There's not much Russia is producing that uh, would have customers in the United States. And so as a result, uh, until there is more investment, more encouragement of that, of entrepreneurship and capitalism of sorts, such as the Chinese have their own version of capitalism, uh, there's unlikely to be very much trade, I think, between our two countries. Can we take one more question? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you for coming, Senator. I'd like to take you back to uh, nuclear arms and uh, especially the uh, agreement that the administration uh, uh, negotiated with the Iranians this past summer. And I guess my question is two parts. Uh, one is uh, uh, what will happen in, in Congress in the future with that agreement? And secondly, what, what, uh, if you can speak to uh, what happens in the Middle East if, if Iran uh, goes forward and doesn't comply with the agreement and becomes a nuclear power? Well, first of all, the agreement uh, that uh, was negotiated involved the United States and Iran, but it also involved Russia, China, Great Britain, and France. And I mention that because it was an international agreement in which all of these countries felt they had a stake. Uh, in many cases, they'd had a stake in terms of the sanctions that had been imposed on Iran that have caused considerable trouble in terms of economic loss there. And a basic reason why the Iranians won the agreement. Now, I favored the agreement. I wrote uh, an op-ed along with my partner, Sam Nunn, for the publication Politico, which was published elsewhere in many places. Uh, and I did so because I, I believe, along with Sam, there is no agreement that I've ever seen involving nuclear weapons that is perfect. There are always potential problems. But in this particular case, uh, this was our best bet at this stage in development to stop before uh, another year passes and the potential for development of a weapon by Iran during that period of time. It, it, the agreement calls for in the next few weeks, most of the uh, material, fissionable material, to be destroyed or to leave Iran. For the centrifuges that uh, create uh, highly enriched uranium to be taken down, over two-thirds of them. Uh, for specific things of this sort to happen before the world releases the sanctions against Iran. 
Uh, we're going to know by, I think, sometime in January, how far we've come along the trail there. Uh, there are inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Committee who are in Iran uh, giving at least some indicators of this. Now, uh, it's an agreement that at best would stall Iran from developing a nuclear weapon for 15 years. Some would say maybe only for 10, if you take a look at all the aspects of the deal. Um, so you could say, well, at the end of 10 years, what's going to happen then? Will they be back at it again? Uh, maybe. Uh, the question is, what happens in the world in that 10-year period of time? What happens in our own relationship with Iran? Does the Ayatollah stay in power? Do all the young Iranians, who are now a large and larger percentage of the population, wish to continue in this sort of a regime and these sorts of relationships? Uh, no one knows. But for the time being, we have at least bought peace uh, and the possibility of a disruption of the Iranian uh, nuclear situation for a 10-year period of time. Now, uh, finally, you answer your question, what if Iran cheats? What if they don't destroy all of it? What if some of the centrifuges are still left? These are real problems, and we're going to have to call then upon Russia and China and others uh, to come with us and really to enforce that. Um, but uh, the the deal was one in which Iran may finally give up for at least the 10-year period of time its program without military conflict. In my judgment, if we had not signed the deal, we or the Israelis or somebody would be at war with Iran pretty soon because they were on the threshold of having nuclear weapons. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.